Well, good morning. I always hesitate a little bit to say good morning when we're having a funeral service, but it is a good morning. It's a great day, beautiful day to celebrate the passing of a man of God. So just want to thank you for coming. I think most of you are family, are you? Are you not? <laughs> well, I appreciate being able to be a part of your family at this point in your life. This is a great privilege. Um, to me, yes, he suffered a great loss, but as Cyril and I were just talking, the grieving time has kind of passed, and so this is a little bit of a different arrangement uh, than we normally have. But I just want to say that you are blessed to have had such a wonderful example of a man of God of Christ's likeness, and we're greatly blessed. <clears throat> Let's begin with prayer. Our Father, we're gathered here this morning to pay tribute to one of your faithful saints who has fought the good fight, has finished the course, has kept the faith, and is now with you. We praise you and thank you, Father, for the molding and shaping of Floyd into a person who was worth imitating as he imitated you. Holy Spirit, help us to rejoice in his homegoing, even though we may feel the void in our lives as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Sarah, would you come and lead us in <clears throat> Would you join me as we sing it as well with my soul inside your service bulletin was a piece of paper that has the song. It's well with my soul. And let's do the first verse and then the last verse. some tributes uh, to Floyd and so Father. Uh, Rhonda, I have you down first to come. And then Lighten, and then Rod, and then Dustin. As I was preparing for this memorial service, I came across a spiral notebook where Dad had documented a chronology of his life. And the following reflections reveal what shaped his life, who he became, and how it also influenced me. Dad loved books and learning, and he writes uh, in this uh, uh, journal. Uh, my second encounter with the Bible was at the age of eight or nine, after our family began attending the Methodist Church in Westerville, Nebraska. 
Edward G. Whale was the pastor, and he presented a challenge to all the children in the church to Bible memorization. Few, if any, accepted. I did, he says. Long passages were given, chapters such as Psalm 1 and 23, Matthew 2, 5, 6, and 7. After learning a passage, I would repeat it to Pastor Whale, and all those who completed the course would receive a New Testament. One Sunday morning in the worship service, he called me forward and made some remarks and presented me with an entire Bible. That was a momentous occasion, Dad says. That leads me to my life's verse, for in the flyleaf of that Bible, Pastor Whale had written, If you will read this book and be obedient to what it says, God will bless you, use you, and you will be a man of God. Well, following that statement, he quoted 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So any of you who knew my dad knew that he loved to read and to study. And in the spiral notebook, he listed the books he had read in recent years. And so I did a little math. And in the, in the past six years, in the first month and a half of 2020, he read 244 books, which averaged 40 books per year. He was a frequent patron of the local library there in Stevens Point and Clover. And if they didn't have a book that he was looking for, he would request that they purchase it or borrow it from another library so he could read it. And they did that many times for him. So a fond memory of my childhood when we lived in Fremont, Nebraska, was of uh, a dad taking Rod and me to the library on Saturday mornings to get our weekly stack of books. And to this day, reading is one of my favorite pastimes. Another important ingredient in dad's life was music. And he writes in this journal, as a child, I remember dad singing or whistling as he went about his work in the barn as he did the chores, in the field as he planted and harvested. The songs were both secular and religious. In a church service, his voice carried so one could hear him singing. Mom also sang as she busied herself as a mother and wife. Most of her songs were religious in content, Dad wrote. So our children, uh, Nathan and um, Sarah, always lovingly called their grandpa Whistler because when they visited, he could always be heard whistling some tune if he wasn't talking or eating. <laughs> so as a child of three years old, when we lived in Blair, Nebraska, I was fascinated by the black keys on, on the piano, and I would pick out songs playing by ear. And so I'm really thankful for my parents uh, providing piano lessons and that sacrifice that they made uh, through the years. And, and to this day, uh, playing the piano is uh, one of my happy places. Also, it seems there's always a song going through my head. Um, if you knew Dad very well, you know that he kept detailed records of nearly everything, especially his cars. The first car he drove was a 1926 model, let's see, a 1926 Ford Model T touring car. The first car he purchased was a 1935 Ford in 1949 for $350. But the first car I remember was a white 1962 Ford Falcon. And because of my parents' frugality and wise money management, when they had very little, we would go on vacations each, each summer to places like Yellowstone and the mountains of Colorado with borrowed camping equipment. And Dad would pack every nook and cranny of that Falcon, and off we'd go on an adventure. Being outside in God's creation and exploring new places is still one of my favorite things to do. Thank you, Dad, for instilling in me a love for books and music and adventure, but most of all, a love for the God who created them all. Interesting, uh, I didn't talk to Ron, but our themes are a little bit similar. We talk about this, so that's, that's good. <laughs> um, I'm forever, forever blessed and grateful to have uh, Floyd Cooper as my father. Uh, Dad was a wonderful father. He showed me what it meant to work hard 
uh, be emotionally strong and show compassion to others. I'm thankful that he always showed a strong interest in what I was doing, you know, both uh, as uh, in my high school years and college and as I became an adult, and always gave me uh, great advice. When I think of Dad, however, I, I remember the things he loved most, and uh, four come to mind. First, uh, I remember his love for driving, uh, which I no doubt inherited, as my family can attest. Um, and I don't mean I don't mean three to four hours of driving. I mean like ten to twelve hours of driving, right? <laughs> and so one that comes to mind is uh, when we lived in Chambers, Nebraska. Uh, Dad got Mom and I up to drive to his uh, his uh, brothers out in Sacramento. So the first day we drove 938 miles to the Nevada border, and that includes a stop at the uh, Mormon Tabernacle, by the way. So <laughs> that's how much he enjoyed driving. Uh, I remember the cars as well. It goes back to the 62 uh, Falcons, uh, one of which I think he put me on his lap when I was four years old to, to drive, my first driving experience. Um, others include a 68 Toyota Corolla, way before the Japanese figured out all the problems with them. Um, <laughs> then the 72 Ford LTD, uh, LTD which Dad referred to as long-term debt. <laughs> uh, a 73 Plymouth Fury, a 64, I think, Volvo, a 79 Grand Torino, and so on. So he had a, quite the eclectic collection of, uh, of vehicles. Second, um, Dad also had a love for people. Uh, Dad also showed a sincere interest in people, wanting to know who they were, what they needed, and what he could do to help. Um, Dad could talk in a meaningful way to anybody, uh, youth, um, young people, older people, seniors, it, it, it didn't matter. Uh, because he was, you know, always drawn, people were always drawn to God's sincere, or his dad's sincere interest in their lives, as well as the humor that he would often interject in the conversation. And third, um, I think of love and devotion mom had, dad had for mom, especially, you know, once mom entered into uh, her last few years of life, and how he would say it was his mission in life now to take care of mom, which he did uh, extraordinarily well until her passing last August. Um, I think I told this story before, but mom and dad had you know, quite the journey through life, as you can imagine, uh, 68 years of marriage. Uh, of course, they had their differences, which you know, any happy couple would have with three children through uh, moving in Kansas and Nebraska and, and Iowa and so forth. But uh, I always observed, no matter the circumstances, dad's respect and love for mom. Um, for example, I remember hearing a story about when they were driving through the sandhills of Nebraska to see some friends, and uh, after stopping for lunch and getting back into the car and driving down the road about an hour, the mom suddenly realized she had left her purse back at the restaurant. Well, Dad was uh, obviously a little upset as he had now, you know, turn around and go back to the restaurant. But as they got closer to the restaurant, and his mom was about to get out of the car to get her purse, Dad said in a humble voice, humble voice, well, while you're in there, you might as well get my hat, too. That's typical, right? Yeah. True story. True story. And lastly, most importantly, I think, uh, Dad's love for his Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, which he showed not only through his 50 years of pastoring from Kansas to Nebraska and Iowa, but his continued passion for studying the Word of God. When I, think of, when I think of Dad now, I think of the parable of talents told to in Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. In the analogy to the kingdom of God, Dad understood and practiced living his life not according to his own wishes, but that of his own, of our lives to God. And stated in verse 21, his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in over a few things. I will set you over much. Enter into the kingdom of joy of the Lord. So I love you, Dad, and look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, there's some uh, similarities with our stories. <laughs> Talking about the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, uh, Dad grew up on a farm near Westerville, Nebraska, the oldest of three boys. John and Keith 
As a farm kid, he milked cows, put up hay, and picked corn, which didn't leave time for mischief. <laughs> yeah, except for one day in particular. During the war, their pasture was used as a practice bombing range. <laughs> So apparently one day dad and Don found one of those unexploded bombs and drug it home. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it was not well received by Grandma Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, later, later on as dad's family grew, summer vacations were camping trips to the Ozarks, the Tetons in Colorado, church camp in conference in Hansley was one of the summer highlights. Those trips always also showed his mastery of packing everything into the trunks of those Ford Falcons. <laughs> 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 so, Dad writing this has called up a lot of memories. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to miss the Saturday morning telephone calls after the Hardy's routine. <laughs> so we didn't always talk about anything of importance, we just talked, I miss that. Finally, I am so blessed to have you as my dad. See you on the other side, love you. So, um, I just want to take this time because I appreciate the time that Grandpa took to write the family letter, which you guys are all very aware of, and uh, I appreciate um, his writing ability, his writing style, and just um, hearing his, his words. So, I wanted to, when he passed away, I wanted to write a letter to him because um, I, I, I always meant to write, and, uh, you know, I, this is, unfortunately, you know, I, this is now that letter that I wanted to write, read to Grandpa, so, uh, Grandpa, you took the time to write a family letter every month for as long as I can remember. On your typewritten letter, you seem to revel in the opportunity to keep the entire family abreast of every milestone every occasion, not limited to birthdays, new additions to the family, and happenings in general. You communicated the status of your life, of our lives, for all of us to share together. I could tell that you were, that you really enjoyed writing, and it showed in the way in which you eloquently and enthusiastically relayed the state of family affairs. When I read your letters, I seemed to take a trip back in time. I reflected and remembered the savory smell of turkey cooking in the kitchen while all of us cousins celebrated each other's company and enjoyed the time together with our aunts, uncles, parents, and our beloved grandparents who started it all. Reading your letters reminded me of this. When I look back at those times, I can vividly recall such exciting moments, pulling up in the driveway from a long, inexhaustible journey from Sioux City, only to be met with a warm family welcome into your University Park household. Greeted with hugs and nostalgic aromas wafting from the cozy two-story house on Bethel Street. Us cousins, we remember the forbidden frigid back room that <laughs> overlooked the backyard during the wintertime when the Christmas spirit brought us all together. We remember the flimsy card table that was deemed the kids' table, <laughs> where we entertained ourselves in the kitchen, bantering and entertaining ourselves with silly games. Brandon and Sarah, you two always carried the older kid chip on your shoulder. <laughs> but little did you know that Nathan and I were constantly scheming, devising a way to prove our worth in a world full of adults with parameters and Older siblings with audacity. <laughs> when I think of you, Grandpa, I can't help but think of my dad. Your passion and interest in cars was passed down to him, 
and became a compelling bond that he shares with me to this day. Your love and talent in photography was also passed down the line as you appreciated the capture of precious events and time. From candid family moments to beautiful Nebraska landscapes, you passed the torch and unconsciously fueled an appreciation for life and its precious moments. You were probably the reason that I somehow came to understand the rule of thirds in landscape photography. Grandpa, this is that letter, the letter that I always meant to write you. The letter to let you know how much I appreciate the updates and the relaying of all things family. I'll miss you dearly, but I'm content in knowing that you lived a glorious life filled with love and joy. You were and are such a good man. I know that now you are with grandma and that your life is complete. Your time on this earth may be through, but your journey has just begun. You're a pretty good letter writer yourself, young man. <laughs> I think you got that from your grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> well, Neil and Rhonda sent me a copy of the personal testimony that Floyd had written a few years back, and he entitled it, I Was There. I, I love that. If you want a copy of that testimony, and you may when I get done uh, reading it, Give me your email address, and if it's okay, I will send an email to of his testimony to anyone who would like to have it. But <clears throat> I've, uh, I've encouraged people to write out their testimony for many years. I have written mine out, but it's been a long time ago, and just talking to Rhonda, she's kind of jarred her to maybe get to doing that. Maybe it will jar some of you to, to start writing your testimony. Take some time and pray over it that you really remember the details, because details are evidence that, as Floyd said, I was there. So, <clears throat> Floyd's testimony is, is the best I've ever read, because it reveals the wonderful works of God in Floyd's life, and how the Holy Spirit used people in Floyd's life to, to move him along in his spiritual journey. <clears throat> Uh, just, just reading now. Each one of us has a story to tell that encompasses many stories. It is the story of life. It's similar to a jigsaw puzzle, not fully out of the box and lying on the table. But piece by piece, the story is written on the pages of life. Then one day across the entire puzzle or the life is written the word finished. Lloyd's story is finished, but his influence is not finished. <laughs> I can see it in, in your lives, and I'm so grateful for that. There are stories within the big story, stories that include family, places, relationships, occupations, experiences, religion, books, education, and more. <clears throat> these, <clears throat> excuse me, these reminders of victories and failures of goals and losses of blessings and hurts these are part of life's stories for example the story of family it is here that the pictures come into sharp focus we visualize the the incident like packing the trunk of the falcon <laughs> as we tell one of many family stories for my wife maureen and myself three children six grandchildren six great-grandchildren just a story in the story. Maddie, a twin great-grandchild, when she was a little one, her mother, in the disciplining of her three girls, had appointed a personal spot for each one where they could go for times of discipline. For the <clears throat> and quietness, in other words, no talking, <laughs> during those moments on the, <clears throat> on the spot that Maddie was supposed to be in. But Maddie was talking on her spot. Sarah reminded her, no talking when you're on your spot. Am I looking at Maddie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You remember what she said? <laughs> no talking, Maddie. <laughs> but Maddie says, but mom, I'm talking to God. <laughs> oh, that's cute. But now to Floyd's story. 
he writes, I want to focus a bit on my childhood, and in particular when I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. This, of course, involves events and people in the Lord. My birthplace was a sod house in central Nebraska, about 10 miles southwest of Ansley. It was there as a child, I was attacked by the biggest rooster that ever escaped the frying pan. <laughs> I remember another time when my mother grabbed me and ran outside because there was an airplane going over and I had never seen an airplane. Can you imagine never seeing an airplane? Now we don't even pay attention to them when they go over. But <clears throat> He goes on, my parents did as other farmers who did not own land, moved every three or four years. One of those farms was in Ashgrove, was in the Ashgrove community. By the time I was six or seven years old, I had not been to Sunday school or church. My parents lived about 10 miles from town. One summer, someone came to that schoolhouse and held Sunday school classes, which my brother and I attended. Do you remember that? <clears throat> Yes, we brought home the little three inch by four inch picture story cards. I do not know who the people were who came to the Ash Grove Schoolhouse, but God no doubt through them permitted some spiritual light to shine into my heart and mind. So here we see the Holy Spirit beginning to work in Floyd's life, pursuing him <clears throat> and using people who went out of their way to reach out to other people. In 1938, my Folks moved to the Cleon Moody farm, three or four miles west of Westerville. Shortly after the move, Don Sam, a neighbor who attended an Assembly of God church, visited us. See, there's someone reaching out. <clears throat> he had been out in his barn praying, and he felt he should invite his new neighbors to church. See, there's the Holy Spirit at work again, <clears throat> as this brother prayed. As a child, this praying in the barn was something new. I thought one only prayed in the church. But shortly after Don's visit, Edward G. Whale, pastor of the Methodist Church in Westerville, came and ex extended an invitation to our family to the church. Westerville was a small village of two churches, the Methodist and the Assembly of God, a grocery store and a post office, a blacksmith shop, a grade school and high school, and about a dozen houses. Our family began attending the Methodist Church. The church building, and here's a detail, the church building was lighted by the village generator heated by some kind of furnace. There was long churchy papered windows. I don't understand that. <clears throat> Maybe they had colored paper on the windows or something, but the furniture included a pulpit, a piano, an altar made by two by two spindles with a two before on the top, dark brown in color details. I was there. <clears throat> Church services included Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Sunday school, Wednesday evening, and revival meetings. Oh yes, the revival meetings. Floyd Monk, a mission student, and Bill Arnett, a ministerial student at, from Asbury, held a revival meeting. Bill often quoted Hebrews 2.31, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? An invitation was given to come to Jesus, and as the, as the congregation sang, all to Jesus I surrender. As a young child, I walked down that long aisle, bowed at that simple dark brown altar, and gave my heart to Jesus. And then he writes, this was very real to me as a child, as an experience with God. It was very real to him. <clears throat> Beloved, we must know that we have had an experience with God. It has to be. I was there and experienced it. <clears throat> His spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. Then Floyd writes, the follow-up was important. <clears throat> I remember and visualize even now the Sunday morning when I with others went forward to receive the ordinance of baptism. In my heart, there was such a presence of God. I never felt a need of baptism since then. <clears throat> See, Floyd was a changed person. He had something now that he did not have before. Eternal life, the Holy Spirit. 
Pastor Whale, as Rhonda said, an ordained Presbyterian minister supplying the Methodist Church in Westerville, challenged the children to Bible memorization with the presentation of a New Testament when completed. These scriptures were more than just Jesus wept, or God is love, or John 3.16. They included Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Genesis chapter 1, Matthew chapter 2, John chapter 14, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and 1 Corinthians 13. After memorizing the acquired, required assignments, I would quote them to Pastor Whale. He, Floyd had a hunger for the Word of God. <clears throat> then the Sunday morning arrived for the New Testament presentation. Only my name was called. I had memorized all those verses and chapters and quoted them to Pastor Whale. I was a recipient that morning of not just a New Testament, but an entire Bible, my first Bible. In its flyleaf, Pastor Whale had written, as Rhonda has already said, and I recall in part those words, if you will read and follow the words of this book, God will bless your life. See, that's an exhortation from a man of God, and we need exhortations from men of God. And then, as Rhonda said, he quoted 2 Timothy 2.15. <clears throat> It was during this time in my life when I sensed God's call to be a minister. Again, the Holy Spirit pursuing Floyd for his service. High school days. In my sophomore year, I worked for Roy Garwood, farming and milking cows. It was a good, clean life, except I wanted to be like my friends. Principles had been a part of my parents' life. I was challenged personally to abstain from smoking and alcohol. Yet I had gotten away from the Lord. In the summers of my junior and senior years in high school, I worked for Fenton McEwen, a Christian man and member of the Methodist Church. There was a family altar. That's so important. Yes, even when it seemed to me like we should be headed for the fields instead of the family altar. <clears throat> he, Mr. McEwen, didn't need me as a hired man so much as I needed him in that time in my life as a spiritual mentor. In the fields or in the shop, we would visit about spiritual things as we worked together. I graduated from high school in 1946, and that summer, God got a hold of my life through my mother's prayers. How many times have we heard that it's a mother's prayer that changed the direction of a child's life? <clears throat> he says, I recall the morning in the same little Methodist church under the ministry of Pastor Floyd King, making my way as a 17-year-old to the same altar while the congregation, again, sang the invitation, you know, all to Jesus I surrender. There Christ forgave me and led me in the right path. There's the Holy Spirit at work through a man of God. Here Floyd talks about his college years, but I'm going to let you read that in <clears throat> his obituary. And he writes, in 1959, married with two children, the Lord seemed to say at that time, Keep simple in your faith. What a word. Sometimes we make life too complicated, don't we? <clears throat> when we just need to keep it simple, it's the simple truth of the gospel that changes our lives. It's the simple truth of, of the spirit of peace sanctifying us. Simple truth. After college, we moved to Ottawa, Kansas to pastor the pre-Methodist church, attending the Nazarene Cemetery. And when I... My computer wrote cemetery instead of seminary. <laughs> it doesn't know the difference. <laughs> In Kansas City one year, and then was called by God to return to the Nebraska Conference. See, there's the Holy Spirit leading, Floyd obeying. <clears throat> Backtrack to 1953, while pastoring the Free Methodist Church in Ansley, Nebraska, there came a great desire for the experience of a clean heart and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Where do you suppose that came from? Holy Spirit leading him again. On several occasions under the ministry of godly preachers, I knelt at altars with a hungry heart for all that God wanted for me. Then later the Lord began giving to me promises. Be ye dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Blessed are the pure in heart. He that cometh to God must believe, ask, seek, knock. See, the Holy Spirit revealing to Floyd that there was more there than just the initial salvation. We went to camp meeting 
and I with a hungry heart. Missionary Warren Johnson told of his lacking something after arriving in South Africa and of God meeting his needs at the tabernacle altar I prayed as well as others. A warm, gentle rain was falling Saturday evening as we returned to our cabin. The Holy Spirit whispered, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. What a promise, what a promise. He did, the very next day, Sunday, at the altar once again, Jesus gave me the assurance that he had cleansed my heart, filled me with the Holy Spirit. See, Floyd wrote this in 2018, decades after the experience of entire sanctification, but it was still very real to him. He remembered exactly what the Lord spoke to him and the experience of being cleansed in heart and filled with the Holy Spirit. He remembered it because it happened to him, as Floyd said, I was there. The ensuing years, I have found that personal devotional life is of great importance to the believer's life. <clears throat> Christian books have been an important part in spiritual formation. Through the years, I've met some wonderful Christ followers and recall the names of those who in ways unknown to them have assisted me in my spiritual journey. Of course, there have been my parents, the Village Methodist Church in Westerville, Pastor Walt Whale, Pastor Arnett, <clears throat> who later chaired the theological department at Asbury Seminary, Fenton McEwen, and pastors. Our ministry with my wife and our three children have all contributed to the ministry and my spiritual journey. <clears throat> then he writes, I want to leave you with four Bible verses which have given me direction in ministry. The first one is 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That was his life verse. Colossians 1.24, in my flesh I compete, complete what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church. That was Floyd's goal. Acts 10.33, now therefore we are all here present in the sight of God, to hear all that you have commanded by the Lord, my preaching responsibility. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 1.5 For our gospel came to you not only in word, but in the power and in the Holy Spirit, and for, with all conviction, my effectiveness. When Floyd wrote this, he was 89 years old. He wrote these words as a closing exhortation I have planted my feet upon the Christian way many years ago, and I'm still traveling the way. With Paul, I can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Isn't that beautiful? Like I said, if you want a copy of it, give me your email address and I'll forward it to you. Cheryl, would you come and lead us in a closing song? <clears throat> And in your insert on the back side, what a day that will be. If I can see clearly, you are a blessed family. And, uh, but our blessings don't have to end just when one of our loved ones pass away. Our blessings can continue on for eternity through Jesus Christ. And this song reminds us of that. What a day that will be. There's still more blessings to come. Let's sing this together.
with me for a closing prayer. <clears throat> yes, Father, we look forward to that day <clears throat> when we'll be with our loved ones, when we'll be face to face with you, but that's not today. So we're, uh, we remain here <clears throat> to keep running the race that uh, Brother Floyd has so beautifully described to us <clears throat> in his testimony. So Father, we thank you for the example that Floyd Cooper left us who had to attempt to follow in his footsteps. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for pursuing Floyd to be your faithful servant. Thank you for receiving him to yourself and awarding him with the crown of life. But Father, we pray for your comforting presence with this dear family today and in the days ahead <clears throat> when those moments of grief invade their thoughts. Remind them, Holy Spirit, that Floyd is with you, and you are with them. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>